Yes, I'm an experimenter. <laughs> All right, so not to, so we don't keep a bunch of people waiting. I'm going to go ahead and start and okay. hope that Sean joins us soon. I'll like, you know, if I don't see him soon, I'll invite him again. Um, so welcome. This is Dario Strange. I'm the editor of Next Reality, a site that covers augmented reality in all its various forms from low end to, you know, meaning smartphones, that kind of thing, all the way up to the high end, hollow ends, that kind of thing. Uh, and with us tonight, we have the incomparable Reggie Watts, the experimenter, hey. the, the hey. artist. Say it again. No, I'm just, I'm just. I'm just, I'm hyping your you're, accolades. You're, you're, you're doing sound experimentation as usual. Yeah, guys. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the incomparable uh, Reggie Watts. Um, you all probably know and love him already. Um, I, what, what am I not? Uh, what am I not covering? What if? What you actually were one of the people at the forefront of, um, like the Hololens campaign. I think a few years back, right? Didn't you have yeah. some involvement in that? Yeah, so yeah, I did some assets for uh, for the Hololens uh, a while back. Yeah. Oh, we got Sean. Sean, you there? I think so. <laughs> yeah, hey. we got you. All right. So we're here with uh, Reggie Watts, who I've already introduced, and also Sean Frain, who is the founder and CEO of Looking Glass, which is I I I, I don't know. I have my own explanation, but maybe you should explain what Looking Glass is, Sean. Uh, sure. We, uh, we're based in Brooklyn, New York, and we make holographic displays. So ways for folks to see a little window into a three-dimensional world without a headset. Sean, there, I can't hear him. Yeah, maybe turn down just your volume just a little bit, Sean. Can you, yeah, can you, guys, can you guys still hear me? That's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You two guys, along with a few others, came together to introduce, if not the first, one of the first projects that involve... Um, music, augmented reality, and an NF NFT coming together. Um, this is, I don't know, I feel like, I mean, we all probably know about the uh, the Beeple situation, the artist known as Beeple, and he recently had like the big, uh, I think that was either today or in the last 24 hours, he had like the $69 million sale. NFTs are going wild, everyone, everything from like sports trading cards to like art, but for me, from my vantage point, where you know where we focus on augmented reality, I've been particularly interested in this space because what it allows us to do is actually put a value, like a unique value and kind of a uh, uniqueness to these virtual objects in augmented reality. And I think what even takes it to the next level is the introduction of Looking Glass because now it's actually, you know, a lot of people have their screens and everything. And, and I think a lot of us have been able to wrap our minds around this idea of virtual objects. But there are still people who kind of need that kind of bridge. And I feel like the looking glass device is the perfect bridge for that kind of like, you know, virtual to real. So first of all, I, I remember when you guys, um, Sean, when you guys first started, one of the first kind of experimental experiences you had on the device was Reggie. How'd you guys actually meet? How'd that get started? Like, what, what's the origin story between you guys even linking up at first? Origin story? I don't remember exactly how that happened, um, but... Um, maybe maybe Jake Lodwick? Yeah, maybe Jake. We're both friends with Jake. He's um, uh, one of the founders of Vimeo and um, wonderful guy um, living with some um, sheep now in New Zealand, I think. And yes, yes. he... <laughs> Uh, and yeah, we, um, had been talking about what the future of, um, you know, VR, AR holographic display looked like. And, um, I had heard that Reggie was doing, um, one of the first cross platform music videos, um, called Runnin. And this was with Intel studios. And I was curious about what that would look like in one of our early versions of the looking glass holographic display, um, a couple years ago and, you know, collaborated. And that was the first cross platform, you know, mobile VR holographic display music video that um, was ever made. Awesome. Now, now Reggie, That's I've correct. been following your work for years, enjoying it. But one thing that really always kind of like, I don't know, throws me off is like you are really, really, really engaged in VR and AR. And I'm just trying to figure out like where where's all this coming from? Because like, 
your your experimental approach to music is brilliant. But so many of your contemporaries, if you even, you know, maybe have contemporaries because you're really experimental in my view. But a lot of the you know other people who are trying to break ground in music are like really they're they're, they're they kind of slow roll their way into new technology like this. So, I mean, can you just talk mm-hmm. about a little bit like what got you first interested in VR and AR and and just, you know, what that journey has been about for you? Like what was why was it important to you in the first place? I've seen you in alt space VR. I've seen you. I've seen you in so many different places in the virtual world. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it came, it, it, you know, it, it kind of came back or it's a call back to my fascination with like the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, you know, that idea of crossing over and also the movie Dreamscape, uh, the idea of crossing over into other realities or even time travel. Uh, I've just always been fascinated into in going into other worlds, um, either by magical means or by technological means, which technology, you know, should be magic as uh, Arthur C. Clarke would agree with. Um, but I, you know, so I was always into figuring out how can you, how can you put yourself in a relatively convincing virtual world? You know, maybe I wasn't using the word virtual back then, but, but a world and, um, you know, and then, in the eighties VR was a thing for a second, you know? Um, and, uh, people were like, Oh yeah, VR, it's going to be huge. And of course it didn't catch on. And then in the nineties, the uh, you know, movies like uh, 13th floor and, uh, the matrix and, um, you know, name all of the amazing, uh, kind of like existence, things like that. Um, all of those movies came out and, that furthered my interest in VR or Lawnmower Man, which never watch Lawnmower Man now ever again because the the, the graphics are so terrible. It'll, it might make you throw up, but uh, but it was still inspirational, um, you know, to see technology be able to whisk people away into other areas. So that, with all of that said, I, w- I was always into that, and and art is basically the same thing. When I'm creating a song or when I'm going to a concert or whether I'm looking at a painting, it's all about transport and transportation, and. Um, and some form of immersion. And, you know, and so when techno and I was hoping VR would kind of catch on again at some point. And, you know, sure enough, you know, you started seeing uh, headset uh, designs, prototype designs popping up and, uh, you know, and I'm always kind of talking to technology people and they would, you know, uh, be talking about, oh, there's a prototype that might be coming out soon. And I got to try some stuff early on. And even in the early days when Jake, you know, took me over to uh, show me early looking glass stuff, you know, uh, or at least the, the volumetric display stuff that they were doing. I mean, now now it's not called volumetric, but uh, you know, back in the day, and I was like, yes, if we can take the imagination of of a person or a group of people and we can express it in the physical world, or we can do vice versa, uh, that's what I want to be involved in because I want to be able to create convincing realities, um, you know, to immerse myself in. So a long winded uh, answer, but. Uh, that's what inspired me to get into it. And I just started pursuing, you know, people ad hoc and, and gaining momentum that way. Awesome. Great answer. Uh, so let's just actually like, just get right to it. Like you just uh, announced a new song slash music video called the non-compliance of being in collaboration with Panther modern. Um, this is being released as well, I guess one of you guys explain it rather rather than me kind of like describe it. How how would you guys frame this? I don't want to frame it the wrong way for you guys. I'll hear Sean's side first. Sean? Yeah, I, I just heard from some other folks in the audience that they can't hear me at all, even though you two guys can hear me. So mm-hmm. maybe I should hand this off to Reggie uh, oh. while I try to figure that out. <laughs> Bizarrely. Oh, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that's just, I mean, as long as uh, Reggie and I can hear you. By the way, for everyone in the audience, if we do have enough time for questions, this is being recorded, so don't worry about it. We'll have everything. Uh, you'll be able to hear okay. everything in the in the kind of replayed version. Um, and also keep in mind, like if we do have a chance for questions, you, you know, again, this is being recorded. Um, yeah, this is just, I mean, Sean, just the, the idea is just, if you could just like frame like what exactly you guys are doing with the non-compliance of being, like uh, yeah. how it came about, what was the idea, like what, what led to the idea initially? Sure. I mean, um, we have always wanted to find ways for artists, particularly artists that are creating in 3D, to pull their work into the real world in a way that is persistent, always there um, with their artwork, 
living in the real world just as objects made of physical matter might. Um, so, you know, when a lot of folks in our community started to explore crypto art um, and whatnot over the last few months, we, um, you know, had our eyes open for folks who were doing interesting projects and then got connected up with um, Reggie and um, Panther Modern. Um, and it just seemed like a perfect fit for uh, the first holographic version of a digital creation um, that was, um, you know, minted and rare and, um, you know, so it, it's consistent with what we wanted to do all along to allow different or to enable 3D artists to pull their 3D creations into the real world. And now this is just a new vector for artists to hopefully make money doing so. And, and Reggie, mm -hmm. the non-compliance of being like, can you unpack that name? Like, I hate asking artists like, you know, <laughs> explain your art. But that name is it sounds crypto like it sounds blockchain like. Is there something there? Am I catching something there? Well, you know, I mean, generally when I name things, I, I, you know, this was a name that it just came off the top of my head and it was the first thing that kind of, that I, that I said, and, and, uh, you know, and Brady who goes by Panther modern Brady Keen, um, was like, like, yeah, I'm down. And I was like, okay, great. So, but, um, but you know, upon, you know, further analysis of it, I think what it feels like is the non-compliance of being, it's just like, there is no form, you know, there is no absolute form. Um, and art, uh, comes in all kinds of shapes and flavors. And obviously with digital art, uh, it was always, it was always difficult, uh, to quantify it, you know, because it was so replicable, um, and, and unrare, you know? So, uh, I think the non-compliance being is kind of like a name that kind of celebrates the fact that art can be anything it wants at any given time. Um, and, and this is a celebration of that, that now, you know, it can be chosen in this form, this holographic form, um, you know, and the thing is like, when I, when I first heard that portrait was coming out, uh, I was super excited because you know, I had a, I had an earlier uh, version of their display, which is larger, more developer um, uh, oriented display. And, uh, you know, of course we, we put run in on there too, and it was edited really well. And it was just really cool to see, a holographic music video on there. And so I was stoked to do another one for sure. And, um, you know, when, when I heard about this product coming out and uh, I talked to Dave and, and I was just excited to do something. And then I thought about Panther and Panther his all of his graphics. If you go to Instagram, you check out Panther modern on IG. Uh, it's all motion graphics, like really beautiful, brilliant design, 3d, uh, motion graphics. And, uh, he's so great at that. And he's a DIY guy. I mean, he does everything himself. And so I, I, when I saw his language, his uh, design language and, and, and what he was putting out there, it immediately corresponded to, you know, a holographic display because it just wants to be there. And uh, so it was just a natural uh, no brainer to just kind of fuse it. Together. And I'm a huge industrial head. And so to make an industrial music video for <laughs> for this cyberpunk display is perfect. So, yeah. So, so, but let's talk about the uniqueness thing you were talking about. So I've been following, you know, investigating, studying crypto for years now. And one thing that always seems to be a challenge when you talk about like mainstream end users, you know, regular computer users is kind of explaining blockchain to them and like what it means, like what a, what an NFT is like, that's kind of the new phrase, but you know, this has been around for a while now. Um, crypto kitties, that kind of thing and earlier work. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, like, how did you, are, are you like really crypto, you know, blockchain conversant? Have you been in this world for a while? Have you, you know, have you been, you know, along with your VR, AR, you know, stuff, have you also been like looking into this space? Uh, I mean, I mean, yes and no. I mean, the, the general idea of it, absolutely a hundred percent decentralization. Um, and what I like to call the direct economy is something I've been in favor of for a long time. It's why I've, you know, uh, been trying to figure out, uh, you know, that problem with uh, the app that I created, WhatsApp. Um, you know, I, I that's uh, going to be fully decentralized at some point in the future with, you know, crypto integration and all that stuff. I just want to get rid of the middle people because for the for the very simple, if not for a very, very simple reason of the fact that it aesthetically looks like shit. 
Um, the fact when middle people get involved in things, uh, you know, large companies, Facebook and so forth, one, it creates, uh, it creates a monopoly and a bottleneck on creativity. And it also limits the expression of the possibility of the platform. And then on top of that, it just looks like a piece of shit because it's just constant iterations of trying to make people fully engaged 24 seven cracked out all the time. So you know, so I on that in that general sense, yes, the mechanics of crypto and so forth, blockchain, that's something I've had to come to understand over time. But my general uh, fascination with it uh, still abides. So what, what just let's get granular for one second. What was your first like, you know, aha moment when you said, oh, I actually have to look at blockchain like closely. Like what, what was the first uh, when and what was it like? What what coin, what project? Like what were you looking at? Well, I mean. Really, Brady, you know, Brady is such a huge head, you know, he's like a crypto head and uh, and he uh, knows everything about it, you know, as, as much as possible. Anyways, I mean, he 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 studies it. And so he was the one who got me excited about it. Like, he's the one who's just been like, hey, you got crypto, you got crypto, you got ETH, you got what, what you got going on is wrapped ETH with you, you know, and um, and I was just like, OK, all right, slow your roll there. <laughs> but, um, you know he was really into it. So he kind of explained it to me and, you know, and it's been attempted to be explained to me, but blockchain wise, but now it seems a little bit more simple, but the aha moment was probably when, um, Brady, you know, was, was talking to me about it in conjunction with this project really. So I've really only come into understand more of an understanding still limited, but more of an understanding of blockchain and so forth through, through Brady's passion and fascination with it. And then meeting the guys from Zora as well. Yeah, this is I'm, I'm finding that like this this NFT movement is something that's really helping people kind of like understand blockchain and simplify things for people, um, in, you know, in the way that the, I, I just don't feel like it was as easy to explain to people before. Um, Sean, like I'm looking at like Looking Glass and just artists in general. and I'm, I'm thinking this. I mean, we should have like entire Looking Glass galleries. I mean, I, I, I mean, virtual art. You know, the beauty of it is that, you know, you can have it anywhere. It's, you know, it's it doesn't need a physical location, that kind of thing. But there are just people who won't own these things. And maybe let's just say the compliance of being becomes like this historic work and goes down in the history of, of this new you know phase of art. And, you know, whoever comes to own it, they want to share it with people. And, you know, people, you know, they can't, you know. Go to you know I mean I guess you, there's some way you could do it like online but I think it would be cool to have like galleries full of like these like looking glass displays full of like these art pieces that are actually owned do you, do you know what I mean is that is that is this something that oh, yeah. has even crossed your mind Oh yeah for sure and you know it's always been a challenge to figure out how um, for artists in our community to figure out how they can. Um, make money off of their work um, when it's distributed on platforms like, uh, you know, the platforms of the day that are showing their, in a lot of cases in our community, 3D creations on two dimensional screens. So um, the fact that those creations can now live in this little space in this looking glass portrait is special. And I, I do think, the idea of um, a rare hologram, which is what this first um, uh, this first piece is by uh, Reggie and Panther Modern, is going to go down in the history books. And a hundred years from now, when folks visit, you know, a museum of the hologram, um, this will be there. Uh, and it's a this, this. There's only one. There's there's literally only one of these that folks can get um, for now. And I think it's a special thing. So, Reggie, how do we you I, some of what you were talking about really resonated with me with regard to like the future of, you know, owning your own content, you know, being a, a creator who's in charge of their destiny, that kind of thing, um, maybe avoiding some of the big and, you know, people who are coming into the space, I guess, like um, Facebook with a. Uh, it was called Libra, but I think they changed it to a different name. They're trying to do their own coin and they'll probably try to do their thing. And like PayPal is now in the space and there are all these like, yep. you know, entities trying to enter. So how do we kind of like keep this? And, and even now you have like the like some of these um, exchanges. I think Gemini has um, uh, Nifty Exchange. 
like you have some of these bigger entities ent entering the NFT space and kind of quickly at Christie's even, you know, they helped um, uh, people. So these big players are entering the space quickly. Like, how do we keep this something that still is, I don't know, creator controlled, uh, something that mainly empowers the creators and doesn't become another thing where the creators are kind of working for the quote unquote institutions, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I think, you know, players like Zora, you know, services like that are definitely looking to try to equalize that field. I think the important thing to remember for creators is, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't have to relinquish your, your power. And what I mean by power is just your ability to create release um, as you wish. Um, you don't have to relinquish that power to other entities um, as long as, you know, everything remains truly decentralized. Um, and, uh, you know, with that in mind, you could partner, obviously, like Christie's, like you were mentioning that, that uh, you know, that facilitated the, the Beeple uh, auction. You know, if there's an expert at auctioning and they provide a valuable service and you feel like it would be helpful for your art, then you could partner with those entities, but you don't have to. Um, so it, in a way, you know, if, if it works as it, as it is intended to work, um, you know, you, you basically artists have options. They don't, they don't have to rely, you know, it's no longer like a gatekeeper. It's not like Christie's is going to be a gatekeeper to prevent people from whatever they, you know, wish to do. So I, you know, that's, that's the way I kind of look at it. It, it, it decentralization isn't the same thing as if it's just purely capitalism, it's just pure capitalism and it's running on the systems, the market-based systems that we're using currently, then of course there's always going to be gatekeepers. There'll be some form of that in crypto people trying to like, you know, hustle and saying like, you know, we're the, we're the ones, you know, we're the, we're the, we're the real way. So, you know, go with us and so forth. But ultimately people have as much power as they want to. And, you know, other entities like Zora and others that want to keep the playing field equal will, uh, will continue to create tools for artists to uh, be able to get involved um, without having to be, you know, a coder. Yeah. So from my view, you are one of the few artists out there who I feel like you're native to this. Like, even though this is your first one, your first NFT, and, you know, you're still kind of, you know, investigating the space in general, like, I just feel like, you know, because of your, you know, investigations into VR and AR and just the virtual spaces out there, I feel like you, this is your native space. This is this is built for you. But I'm seeing this kind of like like land rush, this gold rush of like people like suddenly scribbling things and, you know, and just like slapping things together. Like, yeah, yeah, F NFT, uh, maybe we can auction this. Like, do you yeah. think I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried? Like, do you think this is going to devalue the space like in the short to medium term? I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of, I mean, there's firstism, you know, that's the, the, the thing that happens, you know, when someone does something first, of course, um, you know, then you start hearing other people going like, well, now I'm doing this and I'm doing, it. and then it has a little bit of that, you know, you can relate it back to playground days or whatever. Where it's like, well, now I'm doing this. Yeah, but so-and-so is doing it. You know, um, there's always going to be that battle of like, who's first and it, you know, that that'll subside. Um, but I will say that, you know, looking glass, what, what is important, I think the thing that uh, maybe people don't realize, looking glass is a very, very important device because it adds a device uh, element to the digital space. And it's you know a term that I tr throw around and maybe it sounds hokey, but I call it fidgetal. And what I mean by fidgetal is it's the looking glass enables digital art, 3D art, just as Sean was saying earlier, uh, to be displayed on an on an item and to be uh, onto this display, and you can you can see it. It gives it a real world value with your own two eyes, and other friends can be standing around you and seeing this this hologram. And uh, you know, and I think that this this is an important moment because it's essentially like the portal. You know, it's right. like if you open the portal, and now the digital world is starting to spill out into the you know the physical world. It's like the looking glass is that portal. It's it's the very beginning of uh, the merging of, of digital, uh, you know, without it sounding too esoteric, but like digital consciousness and, uh, and analog consciousness. So it, it's a convergence point and an exchange. And I think that, um, I don't know, I'm not too worried about it. I think it'll regulate itself. Um, but these displays definitely democratize, uh, the space for sure. So someone just registered, I'm sure 
fidgetalgallery.com. I'm sure someone just did that. That's brilliant. That's the yeah. Do it for me. Do it for me. <laughs> All right. So again, just to, to reset the room here, we're with uh, Reggie Watts, artist extraordinaire, experimenter, audio uh, scientist, uh, and Sean Frame, the founder and CEO of Looking Glass, a holographic display startup uh, based in Brooklyn, Greenpoint, right? Is that, do I have it right, Sean? Yeah, I'm, I'm calling you from our, um, we've got a lab in Hong Kong too, so that's where I'm at right now, but wow. normally in Brooklyn. Gotcha. And I, I'm Adario Strange, the editor of Next Reality. We cover all things augmented reality from the high end to the more mainstream end, which would be smartphones, tablets, that kind of thing. So I want to go ahead and open it up to just a couple of questions. I don't want to like, you know, flood you guys, but if I don't want to kind of dominate because we do have a decent amount of people here. So if anyone wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Let's see here. Uh, there was someone who had raised their hand before, but they, I guess they got tired of waiting. Oh, okay. We have Josh. So let's take a look at Josh. Oh, by the way, uh, one reminder, we are recording this. So whatever you're saying is being recorded. Also, if you have like a private profile, I'm probably not going to click on you because we don't, you know, we want to make sure we know who you are and kind of have a sense of like who's speaking. So let's go ahead and bring. Good for you. <laughs> Just got to be careful, man. I don't want you guys to get abused in the, uh, the Twitter space, you know, inadvertently or whatever. Um, James, you are up. Can you hear us, James? Yeah, I um Hi guys, um, I might I might have a problem with hearing Sean, but uh, I'm I hear you and Reggie just fine. Um, okay, and uh, I'm like I have to say I'm so I'm a fan of Reggie. I'm a fan of Sean. Both two in parallel different dimensions, and then like seeing you two guys work together has been like a joy watching watching this partnership. And uh, I'm a backer, and I'm so excited to get the Looking Glass um, portrait. And, I, and um what was um i guess my question would be uh mainly for sean um but i'm curious to hear you know reggie what you think like uh, sean i'm so fascinated with um uh light field displays light field capturing technology just the whole like like google has done some light field experiments um with light field video and I'm just curious where where you see. I know you're mainly focusing on the display technology, but where you, where you see the future and. Uh... Oh, I think didn't you say Sean? Sean, yeah, sure. you... I, I heard that. I heard that, James. Um, okay. I'm back. And um, yeah, I, I I know that folks can't hear me right now live. I hear you now. I hear you now, Sean. I hear you. Now. Oh, it's good. Oh, you do. Okay, yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, I hear you too. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, um, that's a great question. I mean. Ultimately, um, the looking glass is meant to fulfill its name of being this, you know, portal like the looking glass from, you know, Alice in Wonderland or through the looking glass where you can connect different parts of the world to one another that might be hundreds of miles or thousands of miles apart, where you can connect the real world with this unseen 3D digital space. And in the case of what we're talking about with this first uh, holographic NFT artwork, pulling something that was created in a totally three-dimensional um, digital um, environment into the actual physical three-dimensional space and having that live on your desk, um, that's an important step for um, uh, a lot of creations that are made in 3D. So where do we see it going? We see holographic light field display being a primary interface that folks use to create and communicate um, in for um, decades to come. And this is um, hopefully just the very, very beginning of this whole thing. Can I ask uh, 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 probably in the week, two in the weeds nerd question a little bit. I've been trying to wrap my head around how light field displays work and some of the challenges around light field displays. There's other companies doing light field displays. I think Looking Glass has made the most headway in making them accessible and affordable and something you can like, you know, buy right now and put on your desk and learn from it and use it. But I was wondering like what um 
how can I, uh, like, what, 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 how do light fields displays not necessarily work, but like, what makes a light field display? There's no like standard for what qualifies as a light field yeah. display, but um, I don't know. It's, it's like a hard thing to add, like. Uh, I'm trying to be a little delicate, but like, uh, I don't want to ask like what the secret sauce is, but you know, there's other companies that are probably, they're, I'll give you the, I'll I'll give you the secret sauce. I'll give you the secret (laughs) sauce. Uh, I mean, the, the secret sauce is that, um, uh, you know, the display that's probably, you know, in your hand or sitting in front of you right now, as we're having this conversation, all the two dimensional displays that exist out there in the world right now. Um, on our phones and computers and televisions and whatnot, they all have pixels that shine with the two properties of intensity and color. But the real world doesn't work that way. You know, the real world feels real because the light that bounces off of everything around us, our family, friends, people we care about, you know, a river that we're walking by, um, all of those things feel real because that light has a third property of directionality. And what the looking glass does is in concept really simple in that we've just added that third element of directionality to every point of light that it emits. And we control that directionality, um, update it, you know, at 60 frames a second. So then you have this living full field of light that um, has the properties of intensity color and now directionality. So it feels real because that's how the real world works. Good. Nice. Good, James. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming up. We have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, Monica, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi. How are you? Hey there. What's your uh, what's your question or comment? Um, so I'm an educator and I'm just always concerned about children like you know, going right into the vortex of technology and not, and no longer like looking at each other and having conversations with each other. And yet we do want to prepare children for the future. And I do recognize that education is a little outdated. Can you all speak to that just a little bit about, I'm, you know, hearing my concern about children not developing their um, social skills. Oh, this um, is a Reggie special. With- <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thank you. Along with, um, you know, just the, the, the future, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to promote um, a summer camp now that's being closed. And really, all of this is is related to children not having the opportunity to just be with each other and talk out their conflicts, because it's all on social media. Mm, right. Well, I mean, I'll take a first stab. I, <clears throat> I mean, for me, I mean, I, I hear that. And I think that one of my biggest frustrations and why I tend to jump on to, you know, emerging technologies is because I want to see it go in a direction that's that's favorable, that enhances our lives for good. And, of course, you know, being a kid who grew up on on TV, you know, these new technologies, you know, TV, uh, you know, call waiting, all that stuff, uh, you know, those were things that were thought of as like, oh, this is going to be detrimental and there is a detrimental aspect for sure nowadays with staring at these you know various rectangles we have uh you know that we use every day and becoming overly concerned about things and by people that we've never even met but i will say that uh, one of the things that helps kind of bridge that gap where we are able to kind of face one another and, and be in each other's presence and so forth is t- is making the digital world as real time interactive and as uh simple to 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 be in the presence of as possible something like uh you know ar glasses in the in the future when they're very light and you just throw them on and you don't have to worry about like all of the dumb things that you have to worry about uh with emerging technology is firmware updates is it connecting properly is the power source all that stuff we can just slap it on like we do a telephone we can just pick it up see the contact and then hit call and generally it works it works like 98 percent of the time so we don't think about it but um so to simplify, I'm just saying uh, augmented reality glasses, or even better yet, you have a holographic display, something like the looking glass. Now you can have people sitting around a physical display, and they don't need glasses. There's no special equipment that they need. They just need the looking glass, and they're all looking at it, and they can all have a discussion about it. They can interact with it, with interfaces, so forth. So uh, it's really about 
making technology easy to access, but also uh, it integrates with our physical lives in a much more naturalistic way as opposed to sliding our fingers and tapping on glass surfaces. So um, that, that's, that's just a, kind of like my point of view. I think that kids get excited, you know, because they're around each other and they're making discoveries with one another and they're discuss they're, they're discussing it. And, and I agree. And even conflicts are obviously uh, best uh, resolved in, in person. But when we have things that we can look at a holographic display or a hologram of any kind, uh, something that brings the digital world into the real space very organically, I think that that's, that's really important. I think that's where technology actually starts to work in our favor as, as humans. See, I knew that. I knew that was a Reggie question. I knew I've just listened to you so much in the past. I knew you'd have the per perfect answer. So uh, thanks for that. Th uh, I hope that answered your question, Monica. We're going to wrap. Um, can you before we wrap up, do you guys can you guys give us like some information on the auction, like uh, the URL, uh, where where they can find the looking glass portrait? Just, you know, give us give us a few uh, pieces of information to leave off with. Uh, yeah, I mean, folks can um, find out. We've got this pins on our um, company's Twitter profile, which is LKG Glass. So if folks want to check it out, they can see the auction, which is running for 24 hours ish, um, and get this super rare hologram that'll go down in history as being the first of its kind. Um, and uh, I think Reggie has also, you've also shared. Um, where folks can uh, mm. find out more information on um, your Twitter profile too. Yeah, yeah, it's up there. I think it's uh, if, even if you go to zora.co forward slash Reggie Watts. There you go. Um, yeah, but That's it's, all, it's also on my Twitter on my Twitter page too. Yeah, yeah zora.co. Yeah, Z O R A dot C O forward slash Reggie Watts. All right. So, Sean. Uh, Reggie, I really appreciate it. Any last words? Any like, do we have um, what what's it ends in? I think eighteen hours, sixteen hours. How how long do we have before the uh, auction ends? Uh, noon PST tomorrow. There you go. All yeah. right, the non-compliance of being uh, Reggie Watts, <laughs> Panther Modern, on the Looking Glass portrait. And Sean Frain, I, I really appreciate you guys uh, being with us. Again, this has been Adario Strange from NextReality.net. And uh, hey, I'm really excited to see how this turns out. I'll be watching closely. For sure. I hope to see you again someday, Sean, too. <laughs> yeah, likewise. In person, in person. Yeah, I Where's know. Where's the hologram? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah.